skipping a beat, we'll start our first panel. Good morning. My name is Jan Van Eck. I'm CEO of Van Eck Global. We have uh, two businesses. We run mutual funds that invest in commodities and in emerging markets. And secondly, we are the, uh, one of the world's ten largest sponsors of exchange-traded funds under the Market Vectors brand, two of which, I'm happy to say, are, are China-oriented, a dim sum ETF and a, China, a swap based China A share ETF, both listed, of course, on the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, this panel, we have uh, three speakers. They're uh, going to speak for about 10 minutes each, and then we'll open it up to questions and answers. Uh, my only job is moderator or traffic cop. And unlike the Republican presidential uh, <laughs> debates, you're not allowed to attack the moderator. But otherwise, all <laughs> questions, uh, all questions are, 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 are welcome. So uh, mm. Lu Feng, please start. Thank you. And good morning, everyone. And it's very happy to come back for this annual event. Uh, I'm going to look at the prospects of China's economy with some comments on Professor Krugman's recent article on the similar <coughs> subject. Okay. The recent situation in China produced a lot of the very bearish projection on China's economy, among which Professor Krugman's article figures prominently uh, in that subject. So he believes that China is an un another dangerous spot of the world economy and the epicenter of the new crisis. Yeah. Uh, also, he dismissed China's statistics as being uh, fictional the most but he managed to reach the conclusion that China's story is just like another crack-ups we observed at the world. We all admire Professor Krugman's contribution to modern economics, but uh, it is very hard for us to accept his argument and conclusion. As Aisha argued, despite a lot of the problems, China can sustain economic growth for many years. After very brief uh, touch of the recent uh, situation and the problems in China, I shall give three reasons why I believe China can sustain economic growth, high economic growth in many years to come. Finally, I shall use an IM, IMF data set, which may be less fictional okay, than Chinese data, though to demonstrate China's uh, future prospects of growth. So the recent situation and the problems in China, number one, we all know that economic growth has been slowed down. Okay, I don't want to go to details for this data because it's well uh, observed. Uh, industrial activities also has been slowing down, okay, from more than 30% in the height of the period after a stimulus package was implemented to something like, okay, 15 or uh, 10 percent in recent months. Investment, uh, uh, number three, investment growth rate also come down, also slowed down. And uh, export has been slowed down, but import as, uh, in recent months are quite strong. As a result, the trade balance has been shrinking uh, to almost zero measured as a proportion of the total trade, okay. That is a, a highlight issue, you know, in a lot of media discussion is the housing market. Yes, indeed, China's economy facing uh, problems in the housing market, which is highlighted by more than 40% growth for average housing prices in China, across China, during a short, a relatively short period of 50 months, immediately after November 2008, by which stimulus package uh, was implemented. But over last, <coughs> uh, since the end of 2009, Chinese government vigorously introduced four rounds of the tightening up policies addressing these kind of problems. So the data indicates 
that the housing price uh, hikes has been largely controlled, has been largely controlled. So the number six, I think the most important crucial issue mm -hmm. for China in long run is the, uh, to me, worried most is the reform agenda in many crucial areas are lacking and sluggish. Uh, this era including land reform, household registration reform, and non-market, non-SOE market access reform, public finance reform, as well as exchange rate and interest rate reform. Okay, these reform, uh, how can you lacking? I think will have huge implications for China. I will come back to that issue <coughs> later. Of course, we can extend this list of problems for very long, but. I think uh, despite of these problems, these kind of problems, China can sustain uh, <coughs> relatively high growth in many years to come due to many reasons. I only briefly mentioned three of them, okay? The first reason is that even though there was uh, 30 years rapid growth in China, now China's per capita GDP is still only 10% of similar indicator in this country. And there's still more than 30% of the agricultural uh, laborers employed by agricultural sector. So it is quite reasonably to believe China still enjoy late commerce advantage in development economy, you know, which plays a huge role in facilitating China's economic growth over the last 30 decades, three decades or so. Secondly, most importantly, I think, okay, I want to spend a little more time on that. China's basic sectors, housing, uh, household sector, corporate sector, government sector, receives, enjoys relatively solid balance sheets. That will put China in a favorable situation to, hate, to deal with the headwinds and adverse shocks from domestically and uh, from the abroad. Okay, to avoid the crisis, alarming crisis in the projection I mentioned. So first, for example, for the corporate sectors, the data indicates the industrial firms as well as commercial banks, their, product, their capital returns are growing, has been growing very strongly over the last 10 years or so. And now, even during the crisis period and like post-crisis period, they still are very relatively high levels. That gives China, that indicates the balance sheets for corporate sector in China are solid. Secondly, <coughs> the household liability in terms of the banking loans has been increased quite rapidly in recent years. But on the other hand, including mortgage rates, so for example, increased from something like four trillion Chinese yuan to 13.3 trillion Chinese yen, in which more than half, something like 7 trillion is the mortgage loans. But on the other hand, the saving deposit by household sectors also increased from 13 trillion Chinese yen to more than 33 trillion Chinese yen. Okay, so now the ratio, that now the deposit but the household sectors is something like two and a half times as high as their total liabilities in terms of loans. Okay, that indicates the household enjoyed a solid balance sheet. Thirdly, the central government have a pretty good balance sheet indicated by three indicators. First, the deficit ratio, okay, over last Ten years or so, the average deficit ratio is only 1.7 percent. Second, that ratio so far is only something like 18 percent, comparable with easily going above 100 percent in major economies. Thirdly, China's net international investment position is something like more than 1.9 trillion U.S. dollars which gives China a very favorable position to deal with adverse, the potential adverse the shocks. Finally, <coughs> the local government debt, that is the issue highlighted by a lot of uh, 
observers on China's economy. Okay, yes, indeed, it is a problem. For example, the local government debt grew from 5.7 trillion to over 10 uh, trillion Chinese yuan during 2008 to 2010 as a result of the stimulus package. Okay, but, but because of the three reasons, I think this difficult, this challenge issue will not, how can I put China in the crisis, okay, projected by Krogman and others. First, the total, because this expansion of the, this surge of the debt may not occur in 2009, okay. Now, because the vigorous measures has been taken over the last two years or so, this has been largely controlled over the last two years or so. Secondly, 28% of the local debt ratio plus 18 central government debt ratio is less than 50%. It's, um, I fully agree we should pay a lot of attention to that challenge issue, but it's still in the manageable range. Thirdly, very important, I think, 70% of this debt are invested in the broadly defined infrastructures. They have assets rather than consumed up, you know, and uh, instantly. So final, so this is, I think, the balances for basic sectors are solid. I think uh, that is a crucial factor, you know, support my argument. Finally, I, a third reason why I think China can sustain economic growth in many years to come is that Long reform agenda in China, mainly in the land reform, I mentioned the SOE, non-SOE market access reform, they are likely to produce pro-growth effects in the short run, okay? So in other words, there's a consistency between long run reform agenda and the short term uh, reform, uh, short term pro-growth objectives. In comparison, in other countries, developed countries, they face some kind of twin problems of the he heavy debt and unemployment. So in other words, if you want to reduce the heavy debt, you have to introduce austerity measures, then you face the higher unemployment. So there's an inconsistency between these kind of objectives. I think in that regard, uh, China assumes favorable position to uh, deal with the difficulties. So finally, I want to use the IMF data set to discuss future China's economic growth. Okay, China, uh, IMF uh, uh, compiled uh, the, the data for global economy as well as uh, different countries, as well as projections on these indicators. Okay, for example, indicated by IMF data, the global economy will grow at uh, the percentage, uh, at the growth rate, something like 6.8%. 6 5.8% during the period 2011 to 2015, okay. Then I use the, this data, but only one minor, I, I don't think, it, it, I, I don't think it's optimi too optimistic, but actually it's quite actual revision for China's data. Then I can produce three results, okay. The first result is that, you know, uh, China, uh, China will uh, contribute, China will can, China's growth rate will decline. China GDP growth rate measured in US dollars in current countries, currency, uh, uh, current price, will declined from the average growth rate more than 21% to something like 17% over the period 2011 to 2015, uh, okay. Secondly, China will contribute 2.5 four percentage points to the global economic growth in the coming five years. That converted to something like 37% of the global growth, growth during the period. Uh, thirdly, this contribution is even larger than the combined contribution by United States, Euro area, as well as Japan. So in conclusion, I think despite, despite of a lot of problems and challenges, actually China is never in shortage of problems and uh, challenges. I think uh, China can, okay, cope with these problems, not doomed to destination of the dramatic crisis uh, 
uh, projected by these kind of alarming projections. In the contrary, China can sustain relatively high rapid growth and even make a bigger contribution to the future global economic growth. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. So um, I'm going to talk uh, very sensitive uh, issues about the Chinese uh, real estate market. Anyway, uh, this presentation based on the uh, most recent report from the China real, uh, real estate uh, uh, champion uh, of commerce. And the uh, presentation contains two parts. First part, uh, we'll talk about uh, current situation of a national Do I uh, really don't like this? I cannot move. <laughs> I can't move. Oh, it. oh okay. <laughs> you? Okay. <laughs> it's up here. <laughs> uh, first uh, 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 part, uh, uh, we'll talk about the uh, current situation of uh, national real estate market. Second part, we'll give very simple predications uh, of uh, real estate market uh, uh, in 2012. So let's start with the uh, waste too much time. Uh, let's start with the tightening real estate uh, control policy. Uh, the policy control start in the uh, April two thousand uh, ten. In the January two thousand eleven the policy exposure become very complicated and uh, 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 very complicated and uh, 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 serious, and including, including limit number of housing purchase, limited housing uh, price, limit credit loan from the banks, also conduct experiment of property tax in a few cities. And also, first uh, adopted uh, administrative uh, accountability uh, for the policy enforcement. After one and a half years uh, adjustment, the uh, uh, several fundamental factors has been changed. In overall. Uh, the national real estate uh, in that in indicators de declined to be below 100 points, which is uh, in some in kind of, is kind of bound line. In supply side, from January and 11, within 11 months periods, land purchase area increased three percent. And the growth rate dramat dramatically dropped 30% year on year base. And recent uh, uh, housing land price start to fall. 
And in the same period mentioned, real estate development and investment increased 29.9%. It, uh, it was 6.6% low than the last year. But it is still remained high compared with the 25% overall investment growth rate. Growth rate. Okay, uh, at the same time, the new construction, uh, new construction area increased 20.5%. And the, um, the growth rate uh, secondly, significantly dropped 28.2%. And in the meantime, complete uh, construction area increased 13%. Uh, it must be notified affordable housing make up 90% of the increase in new construction. So in demand side, uh, from January to uh, November of 2011, housing sales area increased 5.8.5% which is a small increase in sale. Uh, actually, uh, it, was, uh, it has uh, uh, negative growth in October and uh, November. As we mentioned, uh, along with the sale, uh, sales area fell, uh, housing price start to, start to fall. And after housing prices drop in October, rapid increase in number of cities with housing prices fall. Uh, this number in September is 17. Uh, in October, double to the 34. Uh, in November, uh, it become 50. To sum up the situation in the property market, Growth rate of sales area, uh, sales area uh, fail. Growth rate of investment uh, decline. Growth rate of land purchase and uh, new construction area have fallen relatively quickly. And 50 cities price started to fall. Conclusion is the effect of uh, policy control has been has been uh, uh, has been appeared, but situation is uh, still manageable. So we move to second part. Huh? So what? Is I'll move to the okay. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> we move to the second part. Uh, forecasting for the real estate market in 2012, and there are uh, four fundamental factors to affect the real estate market in 2012: microeconomic trends and the situation. Policy environment changing, financing pressure for the real estate companies, uh, housing supply in the uh, uh, change in the market. Data showing there is a positive correlation between the housing price and uh, economic growth. 
Stability will be the key words in 2012. So we predict economic growth in 2012 will be stable at 80.5% to 9%, which is a similar level of as the 2011. So we believe that microeconomic situation will not give the negative impact for the real estate market. And uh, for the policy environment, the information uh, have released uh, very clear. The <coughs> controlling policy exposures will maintain in 2012. This means real estate market will continue to be adjusted along with the same pace in of 2011. Uh, for a Uh, for the financing issues, uh, with the figures and these uh, graphs, so very clear, real estate market, uh, real estate company fundraising pressure is high, but not as serious as the 2008. Uh, for market supply, uh, according to the sales data analysis, current uh, housing inventory will be finished in 14 months. So this implies market supply will be large in the first half of 2012. So uh, based on the given information and analysis, we expected the real estate market in 2012, there is a small increase margin, increase margin for housing sale. The investment will increase 16% around. Price will be decrease five to 10% in the first half of 2012. And, uh, will be relatively stable in the second half of the 2012. <coughs> uh, the uh, conclusion is real estate market, uh, Chinese real estate market uh, will not crash in 2012, but some merge acquisition could happen among the real estate companies. So, uh, of course, there is a lot of uh, big worries uh, about which the bubble burst uh, will carry the risk out if housing price is going to be corrected, uh, uh, going to be overcorrected. If this work, what case, two kinds of risk should be considered. Risks, to, risks of price correction to banking sector, risks of investment reduction to the economic growth. Uh, <coughs> the uh, two stress test has will reply on these uh, worries. Uh, People Bank of, People's Bank of China, John with the China Banking Regulator Commission, conducted two stress tests uh, for the uh, banking system. The test results become the benchmark of risk verification because of Time limited, I cannot go through in detail for the stress test, but I can give you a conclusion. Take the benchmark 
from the, trust, uh, from the test uh, result, the risk, uh, in risk of Chinese real estate market is uh, modest in short run. Of course, over the medium to long term, the risk posted by the real estate sector <coughs> depends on whether the fundamentals behind the real estate price increase are uh, addressed by policy measures. Thanks. Well, thank you. Um, it's uh, certainly nice to be uh, back. Um, I was asked to uh, make a presentation on internationalization of the currency. Um, I don't have a presentation file, um, but I'll try to organize my discussion um, in uh, three key messages. The first message is, uh, I think uh, um, internationalization is a very important policy. Um, it could potentially be China's next uh, W accession. The reason is, if you look at, for instance, um, last month, we celebrated uh, uh, 10 years entry of China into WTO. Um, there are lots of assessment, obviously. You have your own assessment, and we have our assessment. But I think uh, one consensus view is that WTO accession was a lot more than trade liberalization. The impact it had on economic reforms particularly reform of domestic economic, economic policy and the regulatory system was a way beyond what we thought about when we talk about the trade liberalization. Um, just to give you an example, um, in uh, preparation for the WTO entry, the government revised or modified or abandoned uh, at least 2,000 regulations and policies just to make a domestic system compatible with WTO uh, uh, requirement. So we may have different opinions about the potential for the Chinese currency to become an international currency. But I think the effort itself could be the next WTO accession, which means it could be a broad gu guideline pushing for reforms across the board. And that's something I think we should keep in mind. And if the government takes it very seriously, we cannot promise the destination but we can promise the benefit it may bring about in the process. So I think it's much more significant than many of us may have in mind. Second, I think the dynamism in the FX market has changed quite a lot last couple of years, or particularly during the past year or so. Um, some of the factors were short-term cyclical. So for instance, the people worry about hard landing in the Chinese economy obviously you become much more cautious um, about the outlook for the currency. Others worry about the collapse of uh, um, the housing market. That is also very important for the FX market because if you have a saving for a Chinese or if you have money as a foreigner putting into China, where do you put the money? Not many places. You can put in the banks and they give you negative um, real interest rate. You can invest in the stock market, which has been dead for years. So really, really, um, the only uh, viable place for you to park your money is the housing market. And now the government is very serious about cracking down on the prices, which means you don't really want to keep your money in China if you have lots of saving. So that changes the, the, the flows of the, of the uh, capital market um, also. These are the cyclical short-term factors affecting demand and supply in the FX market. But I would argue what is even more important, structure changes are happening in China. And these structure changes actually are having an impact on what we should expect on the currency outlook. The structure change, what I really mean is rebalancing. Rebalancing is happening in China. Now, most people, when I talk about rebalancing, you think about a trade surplus. Everybody knows. Trade surplus as a share of GDP declined from 7.5% in 2007. Last year was probably 
If the trade surplus is about 2%, I think most people would say the imbalances really is not very significant. But obviously, some others would argue, well, this was a result of a global recession. So once the global economy recovered, the surplus may rebound. Um, that's a possibility. But I think as long as the trade surplus is around 2% of GDP, there is no strong case to argue that the currency is significantly under, undervalued. Um, but if you look at the question about rebalancing, the other big question, I think, is about the domestic economy. Now, boosting consumption has been one of the key policies the government has been implementing for the last five, 10 years, especially during the 11th five-year period. However, if you look at the, the official data, the consumption share of GDP continued to decline over time, meaning the policy really didn't work. However, um, if you look at what happened the last couple of, couple of years, I think there has been increasing worry or question about the reliability of the Chinese statistics, particularly consumption statistics. Now, you probably heard a lot of debate about quality of the Chinese statistics, particularly GDP number one and CPI number two. But I will tell you my own sense is consumption data is equally unreliable. Equally unreliable, number one, you look at one study some economists did last year on hidden income, household income. It's done by the National Economic Research Institute. And his finding was Chinese household income was substantially underreported, particularly at the high end, just for the purpose of tax evasion, for corruption, or maybe some other technical reasons. But whatever was the reason, if you look at the numbers they found compared to the official household survey data, underestimation was 90%. Um, now, this is only one set of data. Even in official statistics, they have a diff two different sets of household income. One is from the household survey, the other is in the national account. Uh, roughly speaking, in 2008, household income was about 13 trillion yuan, according to the household survey. If you look at the national account number, it was 18 trillion. NERI, the National Economic Research Institute study, find the actual income was probably 23 trillion, which means five trillion more than the national account number or 10 trillion more than the household survey number. The same study found household consumption was probably underestimated by 20%. So there was a significant underestimation of the number. And then most people uh, realize there is very important, significant underreporting of consumption. One big area is uh, tourism and overseas shopping. If you go to the Fifth Avenue, I guess there are lots of Chinese tourists wandering around. They don't report their consumption back at home. They just spend the money. Um, and the, the, according to McKinsey's, for instance, the Chinese are spending on the luxury goods, about half of them spend overseas and they don't record in the Chinese statistics. And if you look at, for instance, last couple of years, there was a widening gap between number one, growth rate for the retail sales, and number two, for the official consumption number. Obviously, retail sales and the consumption, these are two different definitions. They're not exactly the same, but I would say these have a very significant element of overlapping. About 80% of the retail sales was consumption related, and that accounted for something like 60% of consumption. So if you see these growth rates are widening significantly, what does it tell you? It tells me that non-retail sales uh, items in consumption has been collapsing. What is non retail sales relate to the consumption. Services. Services are collapsing. Do you believe it if you're an economist? Um, and that's quite questionable. I mean, there are some other evidences I would say last couple of years, household income has been rising more quickly. But the consumption as a share of GDP has been declining. Income has been rising, you probably know by now, wages are rising quickly. 
interest payment has been rising quickly because of the market-oriented uh, financial transactions. Wealth management product, shadow banking activities, trust financing, and even some other capital market items. So overall, I think the, we don't know how much it is underestimated, but I think underestimation of number one, total expenditure, number two, consumption growth was quite significant. So one thing we did, well, we did an experiment using a one new growth rate, we estimate, which takes an aver weighted average of consumption-related retail sales growth and service sales growth. We thought that that's a much better growth number to represent consumption growth. Our result, number one, consumption share of GDP during the last 10 years was on average underreported by between three to four percentage points. Number two, consumption share of GDP actually had been declining by 2008 from 64% in 2000 to 50% in 2008. So it was consistent with the official number. But number three, after 2008, the consumption share rebounded quite significantly. In 2010, the share was 54%. So all these, what I'm telling you is, I think not only the external account is, in, is already started to rebalance, even domestic economies start to rebalance. Obviously, there are some questions that we have to watch what happens in the future, although I'm very optimistic about the consumption story. You look at the structural factors like aging, urbanization, income growth, um, and uh, um, uh, financial liberalization, um, service sector development, and so on. All these mean consumption is going to become a much more significant and important driver going forward. Um, and also you look at the capital, uh, capital flows and so on. So we, we saw last couple of months, we saw um, an average of a net outflow of something like 30 billion US dollars a month, a non-FDI outflow. We used to have like 20, 30 billions a month of inflow, but that could be a cyclical factor. So my conclusion, the, the, my second message really is, I think the economy is rebalancing. Cyclical structure factors is changing the dynamism in the FX market. In the long run, I believe the currency should still appreciate because according to Professor Liu, strong growth will continue. Strong growth means our currency will appreciate continuously in the long run. But in the short term, we, the potential for currency appreciation may be more limited today. Um, even you look at the offshore market, you look at the onshore market, every day the market is pushing down the exchange rate, which means the amount of supply is already very different. So be careful about what you look for um, the, the, from China, the currency appreciation. Normally when the officials told me, when we talk about the debate between China and the US, American politicians look at the three indicators. Number one, external surpluses. Number two, accumulation of foreign exchange reserves. And then number three, significant appreciation of the currency. I think the first two are gone. The last one is really up to PBOC. If PBOC is willing to relax a little bit, I suspect the currency will be going down for a little while. Now, don't, don't read me wrong. I am not telling you that the currency is, has reached its limit and the currency is going to decline from here. But I think two-way movements are much more likely now than any time during the last 10 years. My first, final message is that, uh, well, I think we have made a significant progress in increasing use of cross-border use of RMB. You look at the offshore market in Hong Kong, for instance. The total deposit in Hong Kong is already something like 600 billion yuan which was about 10% of the local deposit, starting from almost nothing two years ago. It was a significant increase. Trade settlement now is 150 billion, billion yuan, starting from almost nothing two years ago. So it's a significant progress. But I'm very skeptical about this strategy because you're pushing lots of currencies overseas without, number one, creating a deep asset market for people to invest, and number two, 
without coordinating with the reforms of our interest rate, exchange rate, and our capital accounts. It could be useful look, when you're looking at the numbers, it's like being internationalized, but the risk is very significant. So I think what we should probably focus a lot more on next is liberalizing the capital accounts, which I think is possible. We're going to see basic convertibility probably by 2015. But that is dependent on a number of other issues, interest rate liberalization, exchange rate liberalization, basic capital convertibility. I don't have time to elaborate on each of the items, but uh, let me say capital account liberalization, we're talking about the basic convertibility, meaning we can give up almost all the restrictions on the cross-border capital flows but we probably will retain some of the restrictions where we don't feel 100% confident. So for instance, the portfolio investment, especially in relation to these financial derivatives and so on, I think these restrictions will remain. But that doesn't affect the fact that you will see um, a, a significant liberalization in the next couple of years. So my final word is uh, internationalization may be our aim. But whether or not RMB can become an international currency, I think it's determined by demand as well as a supply. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wong. Um, we will now open it up to questions. I think uh, there are people with microphones, so uh, my job is just to point if you could uh, identify yourself and uh, ask a question, this gentleman right here. The microphone is right. Good morning. Uh, thank you to all the presenters. They were excellent presentations. My name is Alan Brewster. I'm at Yale University at the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. Uh, my question is to Professor Liu. With regard to the local debt ratio, which is <coughs> relatively high compared to the central government's debt ratio, and given that local revenues are <coughs> often frequently dependent upon land acquisition and sales, uh, and that that may be a declining uh, source of revenue, do you think there's any problem for the future for local governments in terms of their being able to cover those debts and to cover their necessary expenditures? Okay, thank you. <coughs> yes, uh, there's a two major channels through which the local government get the incomes. The, the first uh, is actually formal tax and uh, fees collections. So that is a major part of that. Then there's another one, it is the profits when they procure the land at relatively low uh, prices because of the unique, peculiar form of the land market in China. Then they can develop the land and sell in the second market. They sell in the urban market, then they can make a lot of money. That portion, you know, as you mentioned, maybe it's very cyclical in nature. So in other words, if the economy is not good, then that part will decline. That is true. But uh, first I mentioned that there's still formal, you know, and the taxation incomes and face incomes. Uh, secondly, uh, that uh, land development is uh, not uh, uh, equally shared by all the local governments. It's mainly in the in the in the in the in the uh, most uh, how can I say uh, um, uh, boom you know and the localities. So I think overall speaking, because the three points I mentioned just now, I think uh, that could be some liquidity problems. But if China's growth will continue to sustain, the momentum will be there. Then the denominator will become larger and larger. So for example, this year you know last year. The nominal GDP growth in China is still something like maybe 15% or so. So then the, the local governments still have their regular incomes. Okay, maybe the, the, the land sales profits were shrinking rapidly. Uh, but if the growth still continue there, I think for most of the cities and the local governments, I think the, 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 the problems are, are quite uh, able to be manageable. But uh, I don't mean that there's uh, no problems. Maybe there's uh, actually they reported some difficulty for local governments to pay their loans already. But I think uh, this kind of problems, if managed well, you know, I, I think it's still manageable. Maybe it still can be maintained in as uh, isolated and uh, uh, 
partial, equally, uh, partial programs across the different, peri uh, different localities rather than national uh, problems will cause uh, the crisis mentioned by some alarming prediction. Thank you. Jeff Schaefer, I would join with others in thanking you for very good presentations. The discussion this morning and most of the macroeconomic discussion about China that I've been hearing focuses very much on the housing market, what's going to happen there, on consumption. I haven't heard a lot said about prospects for being able to sustain growth of business fixed investment above the rate of GDP growth uh, with GDP coming down, even if it's coming down moderately. And this is another area where I have a little bit of anxiety and people uh, tell me I shouldn't worry about it, but I like Professor Liu and uh, uh, Yiping Wang's uh, views on business fixed investment. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Jeff. Uh, actually, uh, Yiping Huang just mentioned the Fifty Avenues uh, shopping by Chinese. You know, I'm one of them. Yesterday, you know, when <laughs> I, when I went to there, you know, the railway, the underground railway, it's 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 crowded but reasonable. Then there's a repairs, you know, uh, in the day before. Then they cause some problems. So, in other words, you have the aging infrastructure. But in China, you know, you see there's uh, rapid constructions in the in the underground subways, but if you if you want to become one shopper in China, you use in the underground railways, then you will be crowded just like sardine fish. You know, it's uh, it's uh, so that is one of the indication I think uh, uh, indicates my observation. Uh, yes, indeed, uh, China's investment has been growing very rapidly, uh, exceptionally high. You know, and uh, secondly. Maybe there's a lot of efficiency problems in, in that. So in other words, how to invest, who invests, and what kind of policy environment, what kind of price parameters guide your investment. So there's a lot of things we need to do. But generally speaking, you know, in my, all uh, my colleagues and I uh, study, you know, the per capita stock in, uh, capital in China, it's only something like 20% of that in states. So in other words, if you assume that China is able to <coughs> further you know, catch up or converge to some extent, then you must, uh, you must uh, how can I say, uh, assume that maybe there's a still you know, and quite strong investment. Maybe the growth rate will come down from 50% uh, to 40% to something like 20% or 25%. Secondly, I think, uh, Reform are very important uh, to liberalize, you know, and uh, to remove a lot of constrictions on the SOEs, you know, to reform as or to non-SOE firms. So a lot of industrial policies which prohibit non-SOEs to invest in certain crucial areas. So uh, thirdly, I think reform on interest rates policy and the price factors, um, factor prices, to make sure that investment are conducted in. Uh, more efficient manner. Okay, so in conclusion, I think uh, the investment, even in the future, very long time to come, still play a very important role to facilitate China's total economic growth. But reform are needed in a lot of areas to make sure investment are efficiently conducted and uh, sustainable. Just uh, briefly, um, <coughs> Jeff, I guess um, the, the point about the rebalancing is uh, for investment to grow slower than GDP. Otherwise, we will have no um, uh, uh, rebalancing. So that's really the bottom line. They expect the slower growth of investment. That will have a significant implication for the commodities market, obviously. But if you believe in what I just uh, um, described about the consumption, the economy has been driven by mainly exports and the investment for the last 30 years. If I'm right, we are at the beginning of the seeing a consumption-driven growth, which means investment has to slow down. So I think this is the bottom line. If we don't see investment grow slower than GDP, we are in big trouble. Um, uh, if you look at it more specifically, for instance, the investment, the three key items in investment, residential investment, 
infrastructure investment and a manufacturing investment. The manufacturing investment is uh, relatively stable over time. They don't show big secularity uh, 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 over time. They, they, they soften a bit when the economy is slow. But the two items really move around wildly, housing investment and infrastructure. Infrastructure, especially for transportation-related items, came down from like above 50, 60 percent growth. Now it's a single digit and a negative growth. But that's understandable because we're phasing out uh, um, the stimulation policy. What is I think we should expect is housing investment is also slow significantly because of the restriction. But uh, if you come back, take a step back, I think uh, the infrastructure spending can be taken almost like an endogenous policy response. If the economy is too weak, the government will step up um, in, a, in a investment in, in infrastructure. We do have <coughs> lots of areas that still need investment. No longer railways, highways, and airports, but hospitals um, and so on. There are lots of areas we still make need to make investment. So growth can be relatively stable at this stage, but a slower growth should be expected, and that's ideal. This gentleman. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Stephen Sachs, and uh, I am uh, a uh, chief compliance officer for a NYSE and FINRA broker dealer, and also an a independent director of a very small Chinese pharmaceutical company in uh, Harbin, uh, China. And uh, one of the main <coughs> thoughts that I have and questions I have is on the accounting standards. Because, you know, since I became uh, on this board of independent directors and I talked with a law firm and the accounting firm, everybody questions, you know, are the revenues real? Are the uh, cash in banks <coughs> real? And I know in the presentation you were talking about, you know, that is being uh, part of the Reform Act. But that said, you know, I, I think that's something that's really, really very, very important and from a specific time frame, you know, to have specific confidence you know in in those numbers because you know uh, even I when i when i came here today people you know i mentioned what i'm doing people are questioning you know well are the numbers real how can you trust the numbers so trust is the is the number one thing and we're in this building in the new york stock exchange and you know billions of dollars trade every day and it's on a trust basis so y if you can't trust the numbers you know, you know th there's not much there so i really want to follow up on that because i think that is really the key you know, the trust of the numbers and, and having some sort of working relationship, you know, with the Chinese accounting standards and the American accounting standards. Because right now, as, as Larry Leibowitz mentioned, we have over a trillion dollars of securities traded on just on his exchanges. Plus, you know, there's billions and billions of dollars traded on other exchanges, you know, which, and the people really need that confidence. Thank you. I'd like to have somebody address that. Anyone want to answer that? Um, I will give a try. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> two, two, exactly two years ago, I wrote an article for a local magazine, business magazine called uh, Lies, Damned Lies, and uh, Statistics. Um, I think we do have lots of problems in terms of quality of uh, data, um, including the accounting system um, you just mentioned. So I can't really say put all of my uh, asset on as in a betting that number is all reliable. In fact, I just uh, told you a case study. Um, the number was not uh, um, accurate. Um, and I think uh, you probably will find a lot more uh, uh, examples in terms of uh, um, enterprise data. So I think you have to be very careful if you're dealing with uh, um, the statistics or dealing with the companies. But I can tell you, the growth is real. Um, people who live in China, you can see the benefit. And even if in the US, I think you can, you can see the benefit. More importantly, the system is opening and the Ministry of Finance has been last 10 years, I also, has been implementing a large number of uh, new rules, regulations about accounting and so on. So with the further efforts, I would only say um, will continue to improve, but I, at this stage, I can't really say uh, they are as accurate as they should be. Uh, where's Jan? Is the question? Go. No, no. Oh, okay. Um, sorry, we've got a lot of hands up. I think this gentleman has been waiting for a while. <laughs> 
You have no time to warm up. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. My name is Michael McCune. Uh, I work for a subsidiary of the Corporate Executive Board, uh, and I direct our consumer demand ana analysis. Professor Huang, you mentioned uh, sort of a blended index that you've created of uh, consumer de for consumer demand, reflecting both retail sales as well as service. Um, I'm just interested in any kind of variance you saw across China uh, with those type of measures and, and whether or not there are different drivers of, of that variance in different parts of, of the PRC. Whether the number would be equally attributable um, to different parts of the country? Were you only looking at it as a, at a macro level or were you able to look at it on a sort of geographic specific or at least sort of metro cluster basis? Right. Well, we didn't look at, uh, um, the we, we didn't in the re-estimation, we didn't look at uh, uh, by region. Uh, we did look at the different uh, categories of uh, consumption um, items, but uh, for um, the, 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 the picture, our main purpose was uh, really to gauge what happened to consumption because the official statistics do not uh, 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 make sense to us, particularly for the last couple of years. And the retail sales number, the growth number, sounds more reasonable, but maybe they're too high because they're only a part of the retail consumption. So what we did was, you combine the two growth, sales growth. One is for consumer goods and the other is for sales and get a rough estimation. I would not say this is definitely the most accurate number, but we think this is much better. Um, if you're interested, I mean, we have the formula, we have um, all the data available. If you want to do re replicate the, uh, the exercise for different regions, that's pretty easy. These uh, numbers are all available. I have a specific follow-up. There's uh, several sell-side firms re uh, do their own private surveys. Have you looked at that data? Oh, yeah. All numbers uh, um, I saw by sell-side firms, by research institute, and uh, so on, most of them point to one thing. Consumption must be significantly underreported. But nobody really looked at, at the changing share of the GDP, which to me is much more significant. We all know as I said, the Chinese are spending lots of money on the Fifth Avenue in Paris, in Hong Kong, and so on. These are not reported. The, the, the tourism, for instance, is spending. Domestic tourism spend, spending, the number we got from the National Tourism Bureau was the same as the aggregate number for the, from the Statistical Bureau for recreation, education, and the culture, which means that the last item must be underreported. So, um, so, 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 so I think uh, um, th th these are all very consistent with the impression of economists. Almost anybody you talk to in China, they will tell you these numbers are probably underestimated. But the contribution I, I'm trying to make is really not only the total expenditure is underestimated, but also the growth rate is significantly underestimated last couple of years. Now, if you want to take a one step further, most the sales side of firms look at the luxury goods. So when they look at the consumption, they say, well, it's underestimated. Lots of rich people, they spend lots of money. These can be collected from the market. What I think, if you, if you agree with me, then what should really be more important? The luxury goods market is done. You already know it's happening. What we don't know, at least we haven't uh, been uh, discussing so much, is really the mid and high end quality of these products will rise very significantly. Everybody's income rise, they upgrade their consumption. That's the market we should focus on. Thank you. Okay, how about way back? Hi, I'm Janet Seitz from China Business Knowledge and tangential to this conversation can you give us an estimate of what you think the percentage of unreported income is, particularly like here in the United States, we have this whole drug, you know, <laughs> underground drug sales that we never <laughs> report and it's huge amount of money. So whether it's through vices or just other underreported income. Right. Thank you. Well, we didn't, uh, I didn't do um, uh, analysis on underreporting of income, but uh, um, I suggest you go to um, check out a paper by Wang Xiaolu and his co-author called uh, uh, China's Hidden Household Income. It's published on the first issue of Asian Economic Papers last year. Um, if you don't find it, send me an email. I can point you to the uh, pa place. 
Um, his finding, as I mentioned, some of the brief numbers, when you, because he selected a small sample from the NBS's uh, sample, household survey sample, and his conclusion was uh, household income was underreported by 77% in 2005 and underestimated by 90% in 2008. So it was very significant. But then if you look at uh, the national account number, the degree of underestimation was lower because uh, the na national account number already was revised up by to some extent. In terms of GDP, according to him, um, GDP was underestimated by 10%. Um, this is to some extent consistent with what the, the Statistical Bureau has been doing last 10 years. Statistical Bureau has been revising up from time to time its GDP number. In 2004, for instance, GDP was revised up by 16%. That is mainly because of the missing service numbers, because our service statistic is much less developed than good service uh, uh, statistics. Um, but the one shot was a study not only pointing to these uh, technical problems, also because he said, if you are getting income, if you if you are corrupt, the official official would you report your income. If you if you're a businessman, if you want to avoid the taxes, would you report your income? So this is why underreporting was much more concentrated at the high end. Do we have any questions on real estate? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> Dr. Thuo. I'd like to ask a policy question, if you don't mind. Uh, as we know, one of the things that's driven real estate financing is the practice and the expectation of pre-sales, both in commercial and residential real estate. What we in the, in the states think of as a condominiumizing uh, piece of real estate development. Uh, and <coughs> this has enabled the real estate developers to have a very rapid velocity of their use of capital. And the financing structure is also built around very short-term loans for development and, and, and for land and the expectations they'll rapidly be paid off. And this is a practice that's become gradually less liberal in the large cities, but not as much as one might think in the context of, uh, of a policy imperative to slow down the development of real estate. I've heard it predicted that at least in Beijing and Shanghai and other major cities, that the rules regarding pre-sales are likely to become much more restrictive. And I wondered if you have a view on that. So those policies, I don't think, will be changed uh, in short short term. Uh, for example, in the 2005, as I mentioned uh, in the presentation, uh, so the um, uh, so the uh, right now actually uh, the policymaker probably should concern it a little bit for long term. Uh, not just uh, um, uh, limited uh, the credit loan uh, for the developers or for the uh, mortgage, uh, uh, personal mortgage uh, uh, the credit. Uh, so they should uh, uh, change the policy to uh, for the long-term concerns. The model of uh, real estate market, the development of local uh, uh, the <laughs> The, the uh, uh, real estate market, I think that they should uh, concern the, the more successful uh, way to uh, develop the real estate market. For example, in the uh, US state market, uh, real estate market probably uh, now become less of a, a, a Chinese uh, uh, policy makers. And uh, uh, Singapore's models and uh, uh, the, the, the Hong Kong's models, also possibly German, Germany's models, that will combine together to concern the uh, further development of the real estate market. So the only short-term the policy control the, uh, the uh, housing price uh, change. So this uh, uh, only for the, the, the recently, gradually, you know, uh, get uh, uh, some bubble uh, uh, the, the, the change. Uh, but for the long term, I think they start to concern that those type of policy uh, for the long term development. 
so uh, I think the, um, they expect uh, the market, uh, the housing price will reduce around uh, 10%, 20%, and then they will start a new policy. Right here, you can. Still staying on real estate? Okay, go. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Chris Rubiel, I'm consultant. Uh, I'm interested in ghost cities and ghost fringe areas around uh, cities where there's, there's empty housing or half-finished housing and transportation facilities that are begun or halfway done or almost completed. Uh, how many people can uh, uh, ultimately live in these areas where the construction has already begun? <laughs> so, um, officially, they didn't uh, report any. Uh, <laughs> 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 so, I think the uh, empty rate is uh, relatively high in the uh, some uh, luxury house uh, 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 cities, mm -hmm. Maria. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, so that's why they have policy uh, adjustment, uh, policy control for the real estate market. So, um, so for my experience, <laughs> so uh, in the suburb of Beijing, many uh, um, many uh, house housing uh, actually is empty, uh, just uh, uh, be used uh, in the weekend, or even some uh, 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 some uh, uh, district uh, uh, we see the I never see the lights in the night. <laughs> so there are some. Uh, the uh, area uh, looks like this. So I think it's uh, empty uh, the rate uh, is uh, uh, mm. Yeah. But in the downtown, uh, at least uh, in the big city, may not be really, uh, uh, you know, they can rent out at least. You okay. know, so they, they are not really uh, empty. Uh, nobody re uh, stay in there. In the interior, yeah. are there new cities? There are people who look at satellite photographs and, and claim to uh, see uh, uh, small cities already begun without people living there. Uh, yeah, there's, there's the investigations uh, from the, let's say, the, in the, what's the, near to Beijing. Uh, there's uh, uh, um, the housing area called uh, uh, 10,000, <laughs> 10,000 uh, house, uh, house uh, district. So uh, the investigation uh, the report provides uh, uh, almost uh, 60%, 60% to 70% <laughs> the house is empty. So, but this is very difficult. I, uh, I didn't see the report for many cases looks like this. Can I add a quick uh, um, comment? Um, I think there are lots of uh, um, uh, vacancy, uh, vacancy um, houses around the country, which is true, which is, this is a large, is a, is a rapidly growing market. Lots of rich people bought apartments in the cities. Um, they don't even want to rent out because it doesn't worth it. Um, but I think the, um, the, the vacancy uh, problem is grossly overstated by some big bear, chi big China bears. The reason is you look around the country, yes, there are some ghost cities. I traveled around the country quite a lot. The main city I saw a big problem was Earth was in uh, Inner Mongolia. Um, that was like uh, um, Thailand in 1997. Um, and I think it will be very difficult to continue. But Earth, those remember, is like 0.1% of Chinese GDP. They will need to fix it. But I don't think it's a national problem. The other number I think you need to keep in mind, um, chi China has a relatively high home ownership rate, which is uh, something like a 90%. But 90% majority was like uh, the apartment assigned, uh, allocated to the, to, to the household by state-owned companies, by the government, and so on. Most people still feel they need to upgrade their housing. The commercial-oriented po portion only accounted for 20% of that. So you can see the potential for actually demand is still very significant. Um, I, I, I think people, I mean, I forgot the exact numbers, looking at like uh, estimating how many apartments are empty around the country and so on. I talked to many uh, uh, scholars, experts, and uh, uh, government officials. 
and they just laughed because the total number we, uh, we built during the last 10 years was less than that. Um, so just to be very careful. And you look at the, the, the why housing demand um, is there. Um, you look at the income growth, you look at uh, the demographic change, you look at the urbanization. I'm not saying there's no risk of a bubble. I think the risk of a bubble is rising quickly. So uh, government uh, regulation is useful to contain the bubble. But just because we saw some empty houses and we think this market is going to collapse, causing a major meltdown of the economy, I think it's uh, a, a big overstatement to say the least. Thank you for the presentation. I have a question about that. Uh, you mentioned that the uh, Chinese high-end uh, income owners, definitely their income is overestimated. But uh, I heard that uh, some people said the grassroots in, uh, income in China is uh, underestimated. Uh, it's overestimated because for some reasons. And uh, what do you think? That's why China is no new focus on the you know, uh, affordable, uh, affordable housing and uh, rural land reforms. And what do you think that uh, the increased income of the Chinese grassroots will actually add to Chinese growth or, or will be a, you know, something like a, a, a reduce or some mixed uh, impact? Thank you. I don't, I, I don't see how the uh, low and household income is significantly underreported. Maybe there are some technical reasons, but. Uh, I can't see a strong reason why that happened. Uh, but I think what we, we can imply from um, the study I mentioned, income inequality problem is much more serious than that. Uh, according to Wang Xiaolu's study, the, up the, the top 10% uh, uh, household income um, is roughly on average 63 times of uh, um, the income of the bottom 10%. According to the official statistics, it was uh, 23 times. This, according to some, was the reason why at some stage the government said, no, 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 you shouldn't be discussing these issues in the public. Um, so I think that's a much, a bigger, much more a bigger issue. And uh, our income distribution, as we know, is one big contributor of weak consumption um, going forward. So it's, to me, it's much more an inequality problem than underreporting for the low end. There are some underreporting for um, the, uh, the over, you said overreporting. There are also some underreporting problem for these uh, low end uh, 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 household because uh, um, Wang Xiaolu also found uh, these workers like living in the factory compound and so on. Normally the statistical bureau will send somebody knock on the doors according to certain statistical approach. And you ne never find these low income earners because they live outside the normal residential area. Um, and if you knock on the door of a rich household, normally they don't want to do it because they don't want to keep all the numbers for you. Simply you will pay them 100 yuan a month. Um, so there are lots of technical problems. All right, I think uh, I'm gonna uh, uh, draw this to a close. I know, I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions. Uh, we have a 15 minute break. If you have follow ups on real estate consumption, um, the, the panelists will be here. And thank you again for uh, your time and effort. Thank you.